Right, so what we did uh, before the break, uh, we tried to calibrate this model uh, by trial and error, actually. This process is, could be quite lengthy, especially when you've never been to that catchment, you're not sure what's happening in it. So it's a bit blind search through all possible options. Uh, can be done. Experienced hydrologists don't need any automatic tools to calibrate the simple models. But for more complex cases, when model is indeed quite complex, you would need tools to calibrate it. And we'll discuss these tools a bit later when we talk about optimization. So I will demonstrate to you how can we use uh, software for optimization uh, to calibrate the model. Okay. Uh, anybody advanced in reducing the error meanwhile? Yes? And what is your error? 5.9. Excellent result. But it's not minimum possible error, but very close. Anybody else has a better result than 5.9? No? Okay, you're given more time to do it if you want. In the evening, instead of uh, taking Camperinius, you can do trial and error calibration. So, uh, there was a question if this model resembles other models. So I would also, here look, I mentioned on slide 36. Let me move to big screen now, because we are ready with the model. Uh, I mentioned here NAM model HBV, but also there are a number of other models. And for example, one of the models which is also popular is called Sacramento. Sacramento is actually not the name of the model, it's the name of the river where it first was uh, uh, developed. Uh, but it uses similar principles. There are slightly different equations here, which we choose very simple linear equations. They could be more complex. So you could have, for example, HBV model has a bit more complex equations in these components over here. There could be non-linearities, different functions introduced which would increase uh, accuracy of this uh, uh, of the model. So this is HBV in detail. If you are interested, you can go to website and check how it works. You can also go to Sacramento model or SCA model, uh, where also a lot of material, a lot of instructions how to apply these models and a lot of free codes if you want to, to use it. You see some functions. Some uh, HBV also gives you some hydrological routing, which is not in tank model. Routing allows you to route water across, sort of almost hydraulics. And uh, this type of models uh, is widely used. Now, uh, another thing to mention is uh, that instead of lumped model like here, what we discussed, lumped conceptual model, you can s split the catchment into several sub-catchments. And if you know a bit more about details of the subcatchments, you would build separate models for each of the subcatchment, and then you would merge them over here into one uh, outflow. And you may have uh, several of sub subcatchments, or even dozens of subcatchments. And such model is called semi-distributed model. It's not really a distributed model where you solve complex equations. Physically, it's still the same model, but since you have many components, it's already have some distributed parameters across the catchment. So soil moisture, this K coefficients, sorry, K soil properties, this coefficients K would be different for this subcatchment, this, this one. And if you know types of soil, you could then maybe think, okay, if I used for this type of soil coefficient K1, which is this, I would use also similar coefficient in other models for other catchments where I would be using it. And then you, in this way you develop experience of using this model and more or less you could guess what would be these values of k across different models, across different catchments. Okay? So this is semi-distributed model. So that was sort of quick introduction to modeling, very quick, with the demonstration of a very simple model because by using simple model you can easily um, you can easily understand what is the process uh, about. 
So what are the steps then in the modeling process uh, as a whole? So first, we state the problem. And again, you should spend enough time on stating the problem. What is your problem, actually? What do you want to model? Why do you need modeling? Maybe you don't need modeling. If you need, what type of modeling? You have to state the problem. That's important. And then you look at data. No data, no model. By data, we mean different things. We could measure accurately the water levels of flows. But also, hydrologists typically go to the field, look at the catchment, and this is also data. Without visiting natural system, actually, it's not advisable to, to build model. Uh, so it's always good to be there to understand what's happening. And then you would learn actually a lot. Only then, when you know the data, know the problem, you would specify the modeling methods and choose the tools. So what are these tools? Tools are modeling systems. It means empty models, like this tank model we used, without any reasonable data which you then have to fill in with this data which you collected. And this is building the model. So the difference between the model and modeling system or modeling tool is that modeling system or tool is empty. There is some default data which has no meaning. You can run it and play with it, of course, but there is no real data. When you fill it with data, then it becomes the model, actually. Sometimes People say, oh, we use MIC-11 model, but in fact, they use MIC-11 modeling system. And then they fill it with data, and then it becomes MIC-11 model. So be careful when you use this uh, uh, terminology. So about calibration, we'll talk in a second. And then testing the model. So what is testing the model? Do you know what is testing the model? Test. How do we test the models? With what? Oh, exactly. So we'll discuss it in a second. Indeed, test set should be different from this calibration set. So I have to run the model in new circumstances. If it works well, oh, it's a great model because it works for different data. This is testing. Then we apply the model, of course. And when I say here possibly simulate real-time data, come on Friday to the defense of Maria Clara, and you will perhaps hear about the simulation. So. We'll say several words about this. We don't have time to discuss in detail. But what's happening here, if you have real data in operation of the model, then you may want to update the model a bit so that you would output would be closer to real-time data. It's a tricky process, not always used, because physically, from physical point of view, updating states of the model means adding or removing water from the model often. And uh, you have to do it with care. And then you evaluate results and refine the model. And then you come back and maybe you have errors. You can start again. So in, in a way, modeling process shouldn't stop. You should always look at the model again, improve it, collect more data, and so on and so on. Right. This I will skip if you want to get a bit more details. What I want to just mention here is what was not mentioned in the previous one. We have to evaluate model uncertainty and sensitivity. We'll talk about it in the uh, end of the course when we have time. But in fact, sensitivity is an important issue because we want to check if model is too sensitive to the parameters we choose for it. If it's very sensitive, it's not nice. Because what if parameters have a small error when we assess them? And in reality, they're different. Models would give you a completely different result. So we'll discuss uh, this uh, later. Now, these are two main modeling paradigms that we typically uh, distinguish. One is widely used, and this is the first thing to start, physically based model, or process model, or simulation model, or physical model sometimes, sometimes it's called biological model if we use biology and so on. Knowledge based model, numerical model, it's all more or less the same. So we build such models, you when we understand well what's happening in the processes in this system. If we understand well the water motion, how it reaches the river from the catchment, or how it moves through pipes and drainage systems, and so on and so on, then we describe it by equations, and we 
uh, build physically based model. It's based on physical principles. That's the first thing to do, of course. So data-driven models, however, based on the data you collect about the real world. So want to establish a relationship between inputs and outputs, and this would form for us statistical or data-driven model based on uh, historical data. So example statistical model linking input and output. If you know in the past what was the relationship between rainfall and flow, you can build data-driven model and we'll be doing this. So it's a second paradigm. And modern approach is to combine these paradigms if possible. Why it's useful? Because if this model says one thing and this model says another thing, then something is wrong somewhere. So it's good to cross-check each other against each other, these models, to compare. Okay, uh, there are other types of models, like cellular automata, agent-based models, and so on. So we don't have time to go into it. But in fact, <coughs> these are completely different paradigms. Agent-based models assumes that there are elements that have their own life, own behavior, and these agents uh, sort of uh, talk to each other. Like in social hydrology, you would have maybe some regions where population growth is fast, another industrial region, you can uh, describe this as agents uh, interacting in years to come, and how would they influence each other, agent-based uh, modeling. Cellular automata, you build a regular grid of cells that pass states to each other, and in fact, uh, in this way, you can model some sort of spatial processes when something in developing in cell, it could be also water level, for example, which would influence nearby water level, or it could be population growth in one uh, uh, region, which would influence another one, or industrial growth. And, and, and these cellular automata models, in fact, these cells with the simple rules of interacting would also propagate change in state across the, uh, the space. But we have no time to uh, go into this. Now, why models uh, are important? We already, in fact, discussed this. But one of the things which I want to stress here is so-called what-if uh, analysis. So what-if analysis is, in other words, scenario analysis. We say, what if we build a dam somewhere? What happens then later with the region around uh, this dam? What happens with environment? What happens with flooding uh, along the river, which flows into this reservoir and so on. That's maybe the most important thing, laboratory experience. To imitate real life by models, which is cheap on a computer, you run and then see what happens, what if, what if we do this. And of course, we encapsulate existing knowledge, we generate new knowledge, we enhance uh, tacit knowledge and so on and so on. So all this uh, is important uh, part of modeling. What another thing is important, models facilitate uh, communication between different people and stakeholders and interest, interest groups. So sometimes model pushes people to think. L you know serious gaming maybe? So we imitate development of a, of a region, for example, by uh, card game or by computer assisted games where <coughs> you would put some scenarios of industrial development, what if analysis, and you run this model forward in time, and then you will see mm, people will not have enough maybe drinking water if we uh, discharge all the water through turbines downstream, and where will people get the water? So then different interest group would get together, look at this and start arguing, and developing maybe future scenarios of development of this region. So model then would facilitate communication and that's very important role of modeling, which is sometimes uh, overseen. The thing is that in water resources, you cannot <coughs> uh, build uh, real experiments. You cannot suddenly build a dam and say, oh, it doesn't work, we build another one. But in models, you can do all this. Or in urban development. What if we build a new region and uh, housing, develop housing in a new region? Would your water distribution system would deliver enough water to this region? We don't know. You have to run the model to see it. And of course, assist education and training. That's useful because very often it's too expensive to go to the field and see all this. 
and you can imitate many things, of course, it's important to go to the field. That's without any doubt. But you cannot go to all possible uh, systems and catchments and whatever to see. But in the models, you can imitate them and to see what will happen on, I don't know, Danube if something happens, or what will happen in Elbe River if rainfall would continue for three days in a row, you know, in, in, in uh, Elbe, in Dresden, for example, there were catastrophic floods 10 years ago when a river raised 18 meters above its normal level. So the whole city of Dresden was flooded and a lot of uh, damage was uh, seen. Why? Because there was a, no a lot of rainfall in tributaries to Elbe and they brought so much water that the Elbe couldn't carry all this water so it went up. So that's this type of things you can imitate. You remember we started with data. So where do we collect this data? Gauges first. So if we talk about water, you have to measure water levels, water velocity, water quality, water temperature, and so on and so on. So there are many gauges nowadays, and some of them becoming cheap, actually. So you can put gauging practically everywhere, and you could also uh, arrange uh, radio frequency channels by getting data from this gauging using GSM networks, mobile networks, because ac accessibility is uh, quite universal. In many places you have possibility to use mobile telephony. It means you put SIM card into this thing, it, it would send you data quite cheaply instead of sending people to uh, read data from these gauges like it was 20 years ago or 30 years ago. So nowadays you have a lot uh, uh, to offer to engineers and uh, managers in this uh, term. So for example, this is shows the map of uh, Great Britain. You see how many rain gauges there are. There are 4,000. It's an example. You can go to this website and see more. Uh, 4,000 or even more rainfall gauges in the United Kingdom. You see how the coverage is quite uh, high. And it's gauging only. And there are also radar to forecast and so on. Uh, the problem is, however, that if you go in detail in the catchment, you would find out here you have a lot of gauging, maybe overkill, it's too many. But sometimes you have, and quite often, catchments when you have one gauge or two or three. And they may be located uh, somewhere here, here, and here. So they would accurately give you information about rainfall in these points, but you know where the system may move in the middle, and for a large catchment, it would mean these guys say nothing and there is a lot of rainfall. So in your model, what you will see, that rainfall is close to zero because gauging doesn't detect rainfall and you have a lot of outflow somewhere here. So say, what's happening? Where the water is coming from? Well, it's coming from your ignorance or lack of data. You think you know the rainfall using three gauges, but if they're not properly distributed, you don't know anything, or you lose a lot. And then you calibrate your model against this data, data is wrong, so your model is wrong. So it means you have to collect accurate data. Nowadays, of course, we have satellites. So from a satellite, you can see weather systems and you can assess rainfall. So there's some work is uh, done. But don't forget, the visiting time of satellites is not every second, obviously. It could be hours and days. And also, data you get is not coming now. It comes some hours or even days after the event. So they call these products near real-time products. But in fact, you may uh, not uh, get too much from uh, satellite data. Radars, of course, weather radars, it's expensive thing, but if they're installed, they show you the weather system moving, and there is now a quite uh, accurate assessment of rainfall using radar data. But how many radars do you have in Brazil, for example? Do you know? So, in many countries, you don't have uh, uh, enough data. And also, they make. Uh, uh, sorry? Sorry? I guess it's our case. Our case, what? Many? So in, in Sao Paulo, you have a radar, so it's okay, it's not bad, so it's good. 
But there are places in the world when, uh, you know, then, and also radios have to be calibrated. Please understand, you see the picture of this as if rain falls, but in fact it's not. You have to calibrate them. You have to use software, uh, remove errors, and so on. So, but it's yet another way to collect uh, meteorological data. Now, this is uh, uh, water level stations. In, it's an, I took an, as an example of Great Britain where you have a lot of gauging. So it's 2,300 water level stations, but only 220 flow stations. So the question is, where do we get these flows? Well, flows you get from water level stations and using rating curves. Now, again, rating curves have to be built based on past data. But if you don't have enough flow data, <coughs> your past data is bad, so your rating curve is bad, especially for extremes. For middle flows, low flows, you have enough data, it's OK. But for extreme flows, high flows, when you need it during floods, you don't have accurate data. So you have to be careful when you calibrate your models against flow data. So you measure, that's good. But uh, you know, look, it's almost, almost nothing. So you don't have, well, it's not bad. In other countries, you don't have even this. Also, flow gauging uh, is not always accurate. Don't forget, during floods, flow gauging often doesn't work. So again, the data for the moments you need it, it's not collected. So again, uh, so have to be careful. OK, remote sensing, all great, remote sensing, but as I said, Visiting times and uh, delay in data delivery uh, may not be uh, helping you, you uh, a lot. Still, remote sensing gives you additional data, which is uh, important, especially to look at the post-mortem analysis. Why it is important? If you have uh, satellite data, for example, about inundated areas from satellites, so you know during a catastrophic flood how much area was inundated. It means covered with water. Then you can use this data to recalibrate your model. That's very useful. So you know the extreme event, you know how much was inundated. It, it's a data to use to uh, calibrate your model. So it's visual data. But you also have radar data and so on and so on. So if you're interested in this also. Now citizen observatories. So this is the icon depiction of Jesus Christ. And you see here the line. See this? So it's New Orleans. It's a flood mark of 2005 flood. So water was standing here for a long time so that, you know, this image is covered with dirt. So it's not very nice to look at it, but for hydrologists and hydraulic engineers, it's important data. They know exactly where the water level was. Restaurant owners know very well during floods in Venice where the water is, because they have to submit the papers to insurance companies and uh, reduce the damage, they know very well. So collecting data from uh, citizens is an important uh, thing as well. And if you come on Friday to defense of uh, Marie Clara, you will know even more. So a lot is expected. So citizen data, yes, not very accurate often. Be, be prepared for this, but it's much better than nothing, of course. So. Also, if you arrange citizens into interest groups, especially school kids, you know, they're enthusiastic, it's good learning material for them. Uh, they may invent things, of course. Oh, there was flood. Fish flying around me like this, you know, something like this, so don't trust it. So some uncertainty should be taken into account. So currently we have these platforms uh, like this. Uh, it was Google who gave the data to Australians. Uh, the platforms to, in Australia, there was catastrophic floods in 2011 in Queensland uh, state. And people were reporting data on floods. What is flooded? When? Approximately velocities. So this shows how many messages were collected in different places. And all this data could be brought into the computing center and used during the events. So that's also important uh, role for citizen observatories. I'm looking at this Google picture here on this computer. And I first of all see the delay, but it's fine. But also I realize camera is that way and screen is this way. So half of the time I'm with, with my back to the audience. So I apologize audience for doing this. But if camera would be there, then I would be looking to the camera. But uh, so anyway. 
So when you collect the data, what do you do? First, you have to analyze this data, clean it up, survey, and prepare for the modeling. <clears throat> so there are many steps. If you want to know more, read the book of Pyle about data preparation. And she wrote a book uh, on data preparation for data-driven models, but it's also true for physically-based models. You have to understand the nature of the data, what it describes. You look at the format. You replace, it's important, missing, empty, inaccurate data. Very often you have some strange outliers. During Christmas time, nobody collects data. So then there was a big computer crash for two days, no data at all. Or some strange numbers like minus three, minus three, minus three, minus three. Why is that? Nobody knows. And those of you who looked once at this data, it's a complete mess. And how to restore it? Sometimes it's possible when you have small gaps. Okay, you interpolate maybe, but when you have big blocks of missing data, what to do with it? Or you may have one variable, you have data, another one you don't. What do you do? Mission impossible sometimes, so I have to somehow take this into account. Now, transform, normalize, and smoothen the data. We'll talk about this uh, in a second. Deal with outliers. Often outliers are um, uh, wrong data, but maybe what if not? What if indeed flow was so high, five times higher than normal? Is it outlier or, don't, or, or not? So I have to ask people, call people who know the system, and say, look, in your data, I have this outlier. What could it be? He said, ah, I remember somebody d spilled coffee, uh, you know, on computer and gave strange result and whatever. So, you know, this type of things. Right, we're talking about models. So what is a good model? Question to you. Dream. After lunch, I know. So I need jokes, right? After lunch, to make people up, you have two ways to do it. One, you make jokes, so they have to be polite and laugh, so they wake up. And second is to give assignments or ask questions. So we'll be asking more questions. So what is a good model? Hello. Sorry, again? Output model fits the real data. That's correct answer. Yes, indeed. If it doesn't fit the correct data, then uh, something is wrong, either with the data, but if we assume data is not that bad, then it's with the model. So we assume data is good. So all the rest of this talk, this hour, would be assumption that data is not bad, okay? Otherwise, it, it, it has no sense. So first, we have to introduce formal measures of model performance. In general, indeed, model performance is high when error is low, and vice versa. But the only way to calculate model error is to compare model output to the past data, because we don't have future data. So our model is the model of the past, always. It cannot be model of the future, because future we don't know. Okay, so this should be uh, realized. So when people say, how do you use model in the future? First of all, you should say, first, I assume future is similar to the past. And only then, if it's similar, then you can use this model. But if there is a climate change, I don't know, whatever, urbanization, river is blocked or something, then your river model wouldn't work. Okay? If soil properties change, uh, if you would pave large areas in the city, in three years, hydrological regime would be completely different because it would be overland flow on the asphalt, you know, or concrete, and uh, no uh, groundwater flow and so on. So that's important. So, yes, these are some of the formulas when we measure performance. You perhaps know all of them, but still, it's, let's go through it. So I assume we uh, m measure observed discharge, Q is discharge, but it could be anything, could be water level, whatever, uh, concentration, sedimentation, whatever. Here it's Q, observed and M modeled. And note there is index T. So for every time step, we have value of observed uh, output, model output, and sorry, observed, variable and output model. Mean error. 
So let's look at this. It's very natural way, uh, very natural way to measure model performance, simply to find difference here. Red question, what could be a problem of using mean error? So what? Negative value means that model uh, output is less than observed. Also information. So model under predicts. That's right. So you may have this situation. So w when you have I need another one. This low tech doesn't work. Everybody assumes that we use computers. Oh, good. So look, imagine this is your observed queue, okay? And this is my modeled queue. What is the mean error? So observed is red, model is green. Mean error? Could you assess mean error using this formula? Close to zero. So we say, oh, error is zero. Good model? No. So be careful in using this, because your negative errors would be compensated by positive errors, and that's not uh, a thing. But sometimes it's useful because it gives you a sign, and you can see if it over predicts or under predicts. That's why we can use mean absolute error, so every time we take absolute value, and then there is no compensation negative against positive, okay? And this is often used. Now, why do we use this strange error, which is called root mean squared error, RMSE, which is widely used? So it's almost the same as this, because squared is, is uh, reduce, uh, removes the negatives. But why do we square and then take square root? Why to square it? Why not to use absolute value? Ideas. Okay, I'll tell you. So, <sighs> first reason which is on the surface is that we want to penalize large errors. So if here absolute error is four, then we square it, it becomes 16. If it's five, it's become 25. However, if it's below one, think about this, if it's uh, zero 0.8, it becomes 0 0.61. So it doesn't penalize, so think about this. But over, overall, often it's above one, so then we indeed penalize, we give higher weight to high errors, and that's good, because high errors are most dangerous errors, so we even give them higher weight. Why do we take square root? To have units here the same as Q. Because here we square, we take square root, we, we again, again ba get back to cubic meters a second over here, so then it's all fine. But in fact, y square is here because uh, assumption was when I this error was developed, assumption was that error is uh, distributed using Gaussian distribution, normally distributed, and if you remember formula of Gaussian distribution, there is a square, and this square comes in here. That's why. Actually, if you look at statistics books, when you measure error, that square in Gaussian distribution, which is in the power, it comes in here. That's why square is here. Uh, but error is not necessarily uh, distributed normally. So when we write this error, it's optimal assessment of model performance, assuming error is normally distributed. But if error is not normally distributed, then this is not optimal way to measure model performance. It will be different. Still people use it ignoring test for normal distribution of, of the uh, error. But it's not a big difference. Now, nash sutcliffe coefficient, efficiency or coefficient of efficiency. So this measure is used in different sciences, and in hydrology it's called nash sutcliffe uh, efficiency, but in other places coefficient of efficiency, determination, and whatever, you see different names. So what do we measure here? Look, if you look at this error, here, nash sutcliffe efficiency, NSE. So what do we do? This is uh, squared error. <coughs> if you divide by T, it becomes 
average squared error. It's the same thing as here. You see this? And what is this? D we divide by what? Remember your statistics course, if you had it. Look, what we do here, we subtract uh, from every value of, of uh, observed output, we subtract, you see there is no index t here. It's a number. And this is average value of, uh, of the discharge observed or modeled. It doesn't matter much because they're close, we assume. So we have observed, we have discharged like this. We take average value, that's the mean value in the denominator, and we measure this distance every time, okay, and sum it up. So we measure scatter of the observed discharge around mean value. Okay? What is it in statistics? You said it correctly. Variance, exactly. So a dispersion sometimes called variance. If we take square root, it becomes root. Uh, it becomes standard deviation. But it shows the scatter of the data around mean. So if scatter is small, it means if there is small change of observed values a long time, then this value is small, okay, and this thing becomes big. But you subtract it from one. So we have to divide by standard deviation somehow to remove this variance which influences the, uh, this value. So it's a reparation of this. And maximum value is 1. And minimum value is minus infinity. Okay? Which happens when this is very large. So now when value of this value is 0, what does it mean? It means 1 minus 1 is 0. So this thing is 1. So this error is the same as variance in observed data. So model doesn't do much. It, it replicates variance of observed data, but it has no predictive power. Okay? If it's very close to 1, it means model is very good because it's close to 0, and it means error is very small. Then model is very good. If it's below 0, really bad model, because this... Uh, Variance here is higher than here, which is not nice. Okay, so that's what hydrologists use, and many other sciences just call it differently. This measure, which takes into account the variance of data, that's useful. So, good model typically in hydrology, people say if model is have zero seven of nash sutcliffe efficiency, it's okay. Zero eight is good model. Zero nine, you must be lying. And close to one, you're a liar, you're fired. Models cannot be so accurate. Somebody tweaked the data. However, you see sometimes in publications that it's extreme. It's amazing. I'll show you. I can reproduce data. Question is, are we reproducing the right thing? Is data is correct? If data is correct, yes. But often data is incorrect. So we calibrating model to the data up to a level of very accurate model, but in reality, model is not terribly accurate, but fine. Now, let's look at this formula. W stays for weighted root mean squared error. So you see this W here. This W is the weight given for every measurement at every time moment t. So in previous uh, uh, formulation, this was 1 everywhere, okay? So here we give weight to extreme values or to some values where we have interest. When do we have interest in the model? With high flows, right? So for floods, to assess flood models, you would better give a bit higher weight to your extreme values or moments when you are afraid of floods, okay? And then it would even penalize values here higher, give higher weight to, to high deviations of a model for high values. So you just select looking at hydrograph when you need higher weight than one. That's also a possibility. Now, what else do we want from a model? Let's look at our model. 
which we were running before. And if you go to display what the balance plot, look, model was not bad, but we are losing water somewhere. Look, this is accumulated runoff in the model. You see, red line is calculated and observed is black. So what happens, your model generates less water than it should. So something is wrong. Of course, if you look at this plot, you see it, that model consistently gives low values of flow. It means the amount of water leaving the system is less than you expect. So this is called water balance, and water balance, you should, be, you should try to shift a 5 magic booms, yes. So you try to ensure that a total flow leaving the system observed and model are close to minimize this error. Even if you would not be getting peaks right, total water balance is good and it's excellent. For example, it's important for hydropower uh, management. If you make error every hour, not a big problem or even every day, but if you make error in total amount of water coming to the reservoir, then it's a big problem. So perhaps it's better to look at this thing than at anything else. And for floods, what is important is mean absolute error in the forecasted time to peak. So what does it mean? So when you are predicting flood events, it's important to predict when the peak comes. Low flows are not important. If you make errors, not a problem. Nobody would die, no damage. But if you incorrectly predict the time of the peak arrival, peak means high flow, it means high water levels, then it's a problem. So then we simply look at peaks only, and we as assess the difference number of peaks. We look only at peaks, and then we assess that we are not bad in predicting the peaks. Time to a peak, sorry. So time from now till the moment when we expect the next peak to arrive. So that's what we want to minimize. All right. Okay, any questions so far? <sighs> okay, that was uh, all about models. But I have a question now. When do we have a break? And I have an answer now. Well, I look at the clock. We start at 2 o'clock. We agreed to work 45 minutes. Yeah. I'm sorry, 7 minutes more. So what do we do? We have a shorter break? Or, or we come back a bit later? We have a short break. Short break, but 7 minute break is too short. I suggest to convene at 3.05. Is it a good model of the future? What do you think would be time to arrival? Let's minimize it. So in uh, the break would last uh, now 12 and a half minutes. 12 minutes, 37 seconds. Good, thank you. We have coffee outside? Yes. Well, good question. It should have been here. I should have included. Kling-Gupta efficiency, so Kling-Gupta efficiency is simply a combination of three measures which I covered. I didn't say anything about uh, uh, correlation coefficient. One is uh, simply squared error. Another one is correlation coefficient. And the third one is Nash-Sutcliffe, if I remember correctly. So you combine them all. You square them and take square root. In fact, you if you... Uh, you know, okay, if you combine two, you want to find the point which is closest to this minimum, which is the minimum, and this could be correlation coefficient, and this, this is NSE, okay? So then you want to minimize this. It means you want to minimize both of them. Okay, fine, so that's it. So I don't think it carries so much, but Gupta did very nice analysis maybe 10 years ago of how useful is to use Nash-Sutcliffe and squared error in evaluating performance of the model. Very good reading f 
for you, Gupta's paper, approximately 10 years ago. That's why he started to think about this. And you can use it as well. But it doesn't give you more information than this. And I think it's better to look at three measures separately than to combine them into one. Yeah, yeah. Yes.